Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can now, yes. Okay, okay, then that's my fault. That's my fault. No. Um, yeah, um, so like I was saying, but it, it didn't it didn't come on, but born in Manchester, England, 40 years of coaching experience, um, a coaching license, received a bachelor um, in recreation management. How much of a role did that play in, you know, becoming the coach that you are today, your recreational management uh, yeah. co courses? Yeah, looking back, it was um, it was quite good because at the same time I was coaching at the college. Uh, but some of the classes, uh, and I remember Dr. Twardy, who was very good at uh, teaching um, how to teach. So I took yeah. some of these classes because I also got a, a math minor. And so I was doing classes of how do you teach, how are you an effective teacher? And then in the recreation management degree, um, we had to do certain things about, you know, presenting um, things that we had to teach, recreation things, you know, playing different games. And so that kind of teaching, I was 30 at the time, did help me as a coach. Because when you go into coaching, you've not really any experience of how to present yourself. You just right. think you know the game and you go into it. But how effective can you be as you teach? What are the things to say, what you don't say? So it, it did play a good part in uh, helping me become a coach. I had coached a little bit before then, but this was my first full-time coaching experience. So that degree over the six years did help me i think yeah i think um one of the things because you're spot on because i think there i think there's a there's two sides of the coaching game it's it's what you're saying and how you present it and i think it's super important that you present it properly because if it's not presented properly it might get lost right so i think i didn't have a recreation uh management degree but um no, i was no. able to like like you know there's there's a lot of things in me me and my my sister Victoria always uh, joke with you about you got you say the same things every camp, right? But what I realized <laughs> what I realized is it's a way that you present it that works. And so for me now, when I coach, I I I think about how I'm presenting presenting things. I think about am I coming across simple, effective, and uh, I definitely got that from you. I did not get that from a recreational uh, management degree. Um, in, in your bio, so I got this from your, your bio on Chattic. It says, um, uh, I enjoy helping my players excel on and off the field. As a coach, how do you, how do you personally, and then how, do, how, do, how should you um, help players? And with the mindset of, I need to help them not just on the field, but also off the field. Yeah, I think it's very important for them. And again, I'm in a school setting obviously, right. and, and they're away from home in a boarding school. So there are different factors in play here than the normal coach like yourself who has the kids at home and then they come from home. Um, but I've always felt that um, if you get their mind right off the field, it, it, it's very important. You don't know what's going on in their lives. Uh, they're away from home. So I think if you show that you care, number one, about their, you know, how they're doing, how their family is. Obviously, I check on their grades often and make sure because if, if they're struggling with their grades, that day of practice won't be as effective. So I want to make sure that off the field, things are going well for them so that they feel confident and will enjoy that time of practice. Yeah. The best hour and a half, two hours of the day for them in terms of, all right, I've had classes. The last thing I want is let me and lectured out and not enjoy it uh, because I've gone through, I've had three tests a day. I've got something going on at home. Um, in the dorm room, it's a bit unpleasant. Whatever their thoughts are, I want to get to the bottom of them and find out so that they enjoy and get the best out of practice each and every day. Someone like me, I'm very scatterbrained a lot of the times. I'm always trying to do something new. For you, 19 years at Flagler in Jacksonville, um, you know, I don't know how many years now at Shattuck, eight years with Region 3. How do you stay in one place and say, like, for, for me, there's no one in my life that's more consistent than you. So how do you stay consistent? What 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 are you thinking? Um, why all these different things? Yeah, you know, if you look at the jobs, I mean, um, I'm certainly enjoying the job right now. I could retire, yeah. but I don't want to because I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm of an age and people say, oh, you could retire. Well, why? I'm enjoying it so much. And I think I look at my jobs, you know, when I left Flagler, you know, I was, 
it was a terrific job. I enjoyed it. But then I went to US soccer, a chance to work with national teams and national coaches and youth World Cups, and 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 then did the club scene, and then back to uh, the club scene in Shaddock, um, doing the Region Three thing, and uh, and so I, I think every step I've done, I've always made sure that it was an enjoyable step. Um, I'm not one of these that does something and two years later I've got to move and three years later I've got to move. I, if I'm enjoying it, um, it doesn't get boring for me. It's enjoyable. Again, the college game and the club game, it's always new players. It's not like you've got the same players for 10 years. You know, you look at the pros and you, you know, Pep's now going into his fifth year and they think, oh, will he leave? It's four years at one place. You've got to move on. It's the same message to the same players all the time. Are they hearing you? But with me, with clubs and and, and Shaddock and colleges, it was always, you know, they'd only have me for four years and then move on. So I always enjoyed the recruiting part of it, as I do at Shaddock and the colleges that I was at in at Jacksonville and Flagler. I enjoyed that part of it, getting to know the kids. So I've always enjoyed what I did and, um, you know, didn't really leave because I didn't enjoy something. It was just perhaps a better opportunity. Right. That was, I mean, that was actually going to be my next question, but, um, you know, Going to the U17 World Cup tournament, uh, 1991, 1993. Um, yeah. what, what you didn't know what, that before you checked the bio, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know the details, I just know the, the general story. Yeah. Um, but uh, what, what, what are some things that you learned from there? Because most, most players, most coaches, that's a, that's a goal of theirs to be able to coach national teams. And so, yeah. what are some things that you learned from that? And what like what are you learning every, okay so we'll start with that one and then yeah. the next question is what are you learning every day now because obviously for someone like you who i know reads a ton just like myself now um you're obviously trying to learn new things what do you what what did you learn from from those um basically the heights the heights of youth soccer um what did you learn from that and what are you learning now well you know when i was involved with the under 17s i i, I felt that the way I coached, I didn't have to change, first of all, you know, I am with myself and the coach that I helped, Roy Reese, for those two World Cups was probably, you know, I know you've talked a bit about possibly talking about role models later, but Roy Reese, for me, um, I wouldn't say changed the way I coached, but added to the way I coached. Right. Um, we, we didn't have the national team that often. So when he brought them in, uh, it was a, it was terrific to work with him. Um, he, by the way, was I'd been a head coach at Altrincham of all things, you know, my wow. local club, yeah. uh, you've seen the club. So, um, you know, he coached Steve Highway and, and so I, I knew him before, but he was very influential in helping me add to my coaching and what was important, what was not important, especially on the field. Uh, and then working with the better players was a delight because those players were good people. Yeah. And very receptive to coaching. They were 16 and I think that's a terrific age that you, you know, that the, they all went pro actually from one of the teams that um yeah. you know um went to the world cup or a lot of them went pro and um but at that age they're terrific they're like sponges and um again i think the way i am with 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 players um you know making sure that they enjoy it first and foremost i think that worked there um and then right now you know it's funny um someone said to me the other day wow you you're that old you're that old you know but in our group here at Shaddock of coaches, we meet daily yeah. and we're always trying to get better. You know, yeah. um, our head is always trying to make sure that we get better. And I'm certainly tuning into that because I, I'm not one of these, well, you know, I've coached here, I've coached there. You can learn all the time. And I think if I thought that I couldn't learn anymore, that'd be the time to pack it in because things change. You've got to get better. You, you film yourself, you listen to yourself. Oh, wow. You know, uh, you, you can't have the mindset of, I've coached 40 odd years, therefore just go in and wing it. You've got to be prepared and um, you can always get better. You're learning something all the time. What's the difference between coaching a, a top player like at a World Cup and then coaching, you know, a not top player at, a, you know, a, a normal club? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I'm a kind of coach that does try and push the player. Um, obviously, the non World Cup player, you know, his limits are a little bit less. But I want people who are ambitious and I want them to want to get better. So, wherever you are, whether you're a national team player, you can certainly get better. 
Yeah. If you're just an ordinary club player, you can certainly get better. So I just want to see the effort, the intensity, the desire of a player to get better, no matter where he is. If he's a pro, he's a national team player, or he's just a rec player that's interested in becoming a, uh, you know, a player who plays for one of his better teams in the club, like in your club, plays for the second team. Can he make the first team? So yeah. I always try and push them to to do their best, to work hard. Uh, obviously hoping that they'll enjoy it. So not a lot of differences in a way, I think, because um, I, I don't think I changed styles. Oh, this is a national team player. I got to do this. Yeah. I think I did the same thing with them because I want to see them improve and they were receptive to the way I went about trying to help them improve. I think, I mean, that was going to be my next point as well is I think a lot of coaches nowadays, <clears throat> it's both ways. So they look at a player. Uh, we were actually talking about this the other week in one of our coaching meetings here. We are talking about how some coaches at lower teams say, oh, I don't have the better player. So, you know, my team's not going to be as good or whatever, as opposed to looking at it and saying, OK, this is the level that I have as a good coach. Can I get them to blank right. level? Yeah. And and but it's constant comparing to oh, but the top team has all the best players. So that's why the coach yeah. looks good or whatever. And then you have the opposite where you see a player. He's 11 or 12 years old, 14 years old. And you look at him and he's he's he has the stature. He has the technique. He has everything. And you're like, oh, how high can I get this kid? Can I get him to, to Europe? Can I get him here? But at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it's a kid. It's playing the game of soccer. We look at it yeah. to, to the perspective is to, um, you know, we, we either look too, bit, uh, too big or we look too small. And, yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, now that we're, you know, the more, we, the more we've been talking and all this stuff, you know, not just now, but in the, in the years that we've been talking or whatever, um, I've noticed that there's a lot of similarities when it comes, and I didn't realize where I, where I picked it up, but, um, I picked it up from you when it comes to, um, developing the, developing the person. We talked about this before, developing the person over developing the player. And I think when you look at a player and you say, I care about this person, I care about this person, not just care about this player. You start to yeah. automatically start saying, oh, I know he can work harder. I need to push him more. As opposed to saying, I want to get right. him to PSG. I want to get him right. to Arsenal. Yeah. It's, yeah. I want to get him better today because he yeah. he deserves to be better. But he's a yeah. kid, and, and if he gets the easy way out, he's going to take the easy way out. So I, as a coach, yeah. need to make sure he's on the right track. Right. Yeah, I know uh, my current job, and of course you know a lot about that. I, I take delight in getting some of those players that aren't quite as good. So you recruit a lot of players, but some of them aren't quite as good. And I look at... You know, there's a boy in Oatana, Braden Martinez. I think you might remember him. Came to our camps and was, you know, on the on the same team as Lopez and Flores and and, and Brody and Kate Thompson. He wasn't the best, but I took delight in getting. He actually did more with his talent than some right. of those guys. He still wasn't as good as right. those guys, but he started low and he got higher and he got close to them. And now he's just told me the other day how he's been accepted at a college to play college soccer. You told me that when he joined as an eighth grader, I said, well, oh, it's going to be difficult uh, looking at his experience at our local club in our town. I'm not sure. Y you know, the second team that we used to have behind the first team at under 18 level, I remember saying to Coach Carter, let me take that team because I yeah. would have wanted to get that team to be as good as your team, you know. That's uh, how I am, yeah. That's how I am. You know, yeah, yeah, we, we're not in the same, you know, uh, MLS next and US Soccer Academy. Obviously, that second team just played tournaments, State yeah. Cup. I would have wanted to win the State Cup. I would have, you know, pushed pushed them. I wouldn't have said, well, I don't know, like them to have made your team. But yeah. I wouldn't have said, well, they're not as good as your team and your players. Your your team players are going through the playoffs. These guys aren't going to be on that team. I would have looked at those players and said, let's get them to be the best they can be and push them and demand them. Just they need to be pushed and. Uh, demands made of them just as much as you and your team just because they weren't as good you still got to fulfill their potential you can't be saying well they're not as good so we'll just go through the right. motions or not do as much for them uh, i take delight in actually getting those teams uh, and i think that's why when i was at say flagler where we were naa and we were playing division ones and twos i love my record against the ncaa division one and two because we were not supposed to do so well but i wanted to recruit players that would come to flagler and then when we played and beat a University of South Florida, tied a University of Tampa, beat a Rollins, beat a Jacksonville many more times than they beat us, even though they were Division One, Stetson locally Division One. It that fueled me to say, let's get these players who were 
not recruited by Division One or Division Two teams, came to Flagler, yet we did well. I want to make sure that those guys are pushed uh, to the limit of their ability so that they're enjoying their experience and they're realizing their potential. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to, like, how do you measure your success? You know, not just for yourself, but for your players. Like, right. like for me, I tell my players all the time now, I don't care about the score. I've seen bad teams play poorly and win 4-0. Yeah. I've also seen great teams lose. So it's yeah. not about that. It's about are we are are you doing the things that we've worked on? Are you are you getting better every single day? And yeah. at, at some point, it, the, the dam's going to burst and we're going to start winning games. So um, I think also, you know, going into more mainstream kind of things, when you see these big time managers get fired and you say, oh, but why? They won La Liga. Yes, but you got to measure the success that you have at your team. If you're a Real Madrid, uh, if you're a first team coach at Real Madrid and you don't win the Champions League, that's that's not success. Now, if you're at Getafe and you stay up, great. Good job. Yeah. So yeah. I think it, and and you can shrink that down to local clubs or high school or whatever, because you look at the players that you have and you have to say, you know, every high school team comes out and they say, Oh, I want to win the, the, the championship or every college team says, Oh, I want to win the championship or whatever. But at the end of the day, having a realistic view of where the next step is and getting your team to that step is what a co is what is right. for me, what a good coach does. We were talking today, uh, this week and uh, coach Bob said um, good coaches, do less uh do more with less good coaches right. do more with less and so that's for me he, I was like, that's he, yeah that's because he supports doncaster rovers and he's used to those kind of teams <laughs> yeah and leads um and but yeah, yeah. It, it's one of those things and um you know <clears throat> at shattuck i mean it was a similar thing um i felt my junior year with with john lujano uh blake jones um you know all those guys Right. I felt like we had a little bit less, but we did a lot more with it. I mean, it is what it is. Right. But um, but so so my next question for you is. Um, because we talked about before, we talked about how you you stay at the same job for a long time. And, you know, how how much how much does you know how many? Because obviously you want to stay there because you want to have a challenge. And you saw a challenge for 19 for 19 years at two colleges. You, you saw a challenge. Mm -hmm consistently every year you know yeah. i've read i've obviously read fergie's book and you know roy Keane's book book and they talk about as soon as they won one they are already on to the next one yeah. michael jordan <clears throat> kobe bryant they all did that after michael jordan won his fourth he said i'm ready to get my fifth like mm -hmm. so how much how much um how much does goals play in your your decision making your everyday mm -hmm. life do you put? Yeah. Do you wake up every single day and say, "Okay, I'm going to attack my goals," or do you say it's time to get back to uh, to the routine? Or what? What is the mindset there? Mm. You know, going back, just talking about thinking about what you just said about, uh, for instance, at, at Flagler, you know, and being there for a long time and retooling. The one year I didn't do so well, record-wise, I, I looked at that year beforehand and said, "You know what? I don't think I worked as hard at the recruiting, even though." We had quite a few boys coming back. I needed to get a good group of recruits to push them. And I sort of didn't work perhaps as hard. And that taught me a lesson to say, you know what, no matter what I'm doing, I've got to make the next season better than the last season. So we won a district championship. We did quite well, winning record. But I've got to, to maintain that and make that better by recruiting hard. I didn't want any other coach to outwork me in the recruiting. Uh, and that one year, I perhaps just left it a little bit because I thought, well, we've got quite a good nucleus coming back. But yeah. an injury here, an injury there, didn't have the depth. And, of course, at college, you're recruiting for the future. So you might bring in some freshmen that don't play as much, but eventually they're going to be great players for you come their junior and senior year. So yeah. I, I, I always want to make sure that, um, you know, at my job right now at Shaddock, as we prepare for each practice and each game's coming up at the weekend, I want to make sure that I touch base with all the players. They've got individual goals. They share with us our individual plan. And I want to make sure that they are working towards those goals. I make it a point at every practice to touch base with every player. It's a bit easier now, you know, since that my heart attack, I became an assistant coach. So it's a little bit yeah. easier, I think, for me, yeah. not having to run the show, 
that I can touch. And then I stay for other practices sometimes and make sure I referee all the games that we have, all the friendly games, so that I know all our AD boys that we have. It's a bit easier again. It's not a big club like you. You can't possibly know every kid in your club. I can. They're all at school. I see them every day in the dining hall. As I'm finishing practice, their practice. I, yesterday, as I'm walking out, I watched a little bit of the 17 practice because they were outside. We'd finished uh, our weight session. So I'm involved with all of them. And a lot of that is to do that I recruited them. And I want to make sure that just because I recruited them, then I move them on to another coach, that I'm still involved with them, even though they're playing for another coach. Even though that coach is probably going to look at their grades and push them at practice. I want to make sure that I check their grades. And I want to make sure that they are doing the right things day in, day out to fulfill their goals. You know, and even though I'm not involved with the college aspect of it, a lot of the kids, like I just wrote, you know, so Brain Martinez left me after two years, but then three years of not having me as a coach. But three months ago, I wrote him a reference, a letter of reference for his college that he wanted at. And he sent that into the coach. And great to see that he accepted him. And now he's going to that college. Uh, I spoke to Marco Filas yesterday, who's a Presbyterian, not playing much. He's a freshman. He's disappointed. He's not playing much. And I gave him some words of advice to, yeah. to things like, Believe in yourself. Keep working hard. He gives you 10 minutes. Make it the best 10 minutes of the game. Don't moan and whine about the fact that, well, I'm only going to go play 10 minutes in this game. Make it a good 10 minutes to show the coach. So it's not just the players that I've got now. It's even when they leave, I feel, you know, I just spoke to Danny Flores the other day. You know, he's he's going to go to college. Uh, Virginia Tech, you know, he was at Philadelphia Union. So keeping in touch with um, your Tino's, your JT's, just that ankle surgery, you know, it's just important. I think just to not for, try and forget them and say, okay, they moved on. I try and, as much as I can, keep in touch with them. I don't keep in touch with every single player, I'm sure, but I, I try to keep in touch and talk to other players or other people that know them. Um, because it's not just, right, they've left Shaddock. Of course, you've got other kids, but what are they doing? Are they developing uh, like you, are they going to get married? Are they, you know, have they got a job? What a, you know, I don't want to just stop being interested in them when they're 18. Yeah. Uh, again, easy for me to do when you've only got, right. you know, four groups of boys that I had a big, um, one of the main reasons why they came was because of my recruiting them. So, so the interesting thing about this is now that in our, in our society today, it's about set goals, attack your goals every single day, you know, it's a very goal oriented society we live in nowadays. And what mm -hmm. I'm hearing from you is that you just you stick to your values. That's it. Stick to your values. Right. The things that you, you value most, the, the person over the player, you know, having, re having real relationships and not just, Oh, I coached this kid who made it pro. So look at me, I'm the coach. I, right. I, I got him there and all this yeah. stuff. It's more, and it's more about like substance, substance. It's more about, you know, you know, not 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 necessarily <clears throat> not necessarily accolades or anything like that but it's more about listen i'm just trying to have i'm just trying to make make sure that this kid succeeds whatever that means whatever yeah. that means and right. that's sort of my next thing is what is success for you what is success um obviously it's it's different for everyone else it's de they're different mm -hmm. for everyone um i think it's it's obviously important to define that for you, for yourself you right. don't just don't go based on someone else's success because that's a that's a way to end up somewhere that you wanted to, that you wanted to be but you realized oh I actually don't, didn't want to be here this is actually more than I bargained for so for you what is success yeah I think it's you know and again working with those kids and their families especially so I, I'm more involved with their families you know we had a recruit yesterday he's coming from Pittsburgh uh, we hope he's going to come we had six at the weekend um although I was in Florida recruiting, so I didn't see them, but I set that up. So it, I, I've got a little bit more at stake. You know, they're giving their, their sons to me and our staff um, from different parts of the world and different parts of the uh, of the USA. So, uh, you know, I keep in touch with, try and keep in touch with their parents as well to make sure that um, we're doing the right things that they expect from us. Um, and success for me is to see them achieve their goals. Now, Sometimes, you know, when you talk about goal setting, a lot of them are guilty of, well, I want to do this. And it's unrealistic. I've always tried to tell them, you've got to be realistic. Yeah. You know? So when one of the worst players right now on our under-17s tells me I'm going to be a pro, you don't dismiss it out of hand. But let's get you starting on your under-17 team first before you start talking about 
something in eight years. Let's just look at the next step. So for the under-17 team, you go to your under-19 team, let's be a starter there because it's two age groups. We've got a lot of players who are coming back under 19, just like you played two years, you were 19, three years actually, but you know the two yeah. years when you had to. So can you be a starter there? And then looking at them at the next stop, is it pro, is it college? I mean, quite a few of our kids left Shadok to go to MLS clubs, but they all went to college in the end. They right. didn't, you know, recently they've not stayed and got a, a contract at the age of 18. Two went to Duke, one's going to Virginia Tech. Um, you know, and, and, and different colleges um, that they've gone to. Um, so success f for me is to get them to their next level, whether it's college. And, and you know, it could be a great Division Three college. It doesn't have to be Division One. Um, yeah. But they're playing soccer in college, getting a great education. So they leave Shaddock better than when they came. That Through their two, three, four years, and we're getting some in the seventh grade right now, six years at Shattuck, you know, have they year by year attained their goals little by little so that when they finish here, they're at a place where they can really say, hey, I've achieved quite a lot here at Shattuck. I've really enjoyed it. I'm at college. For the most part, most of our kids go to college. Right. Um, you know, so are they in an enjoyable environment? Are they enjoying the game? Um, I've heard from quite a lot of them, oh, it's not quite the same you know, when they get to college, because it's a little bit different because we can put a lot of soccer in during the day, two a days, pro time from seven to eight. And there they just got yeah. practice. Then they got this, that and the other. And things are different when they're at college. So that makes me feel good that they're, you know, oh, coach, I really enjoy the time at Shattuck. I, I even preferred it to playing at college right now. We only play for two or three months. There we played all the time. So, um, so for me, success is just making sure that they are feeling good about where they are each and every year. Um, fulfilling their goals, and sometimes they don't fulfill their goals. Um, but they're still working hard towards achieving goals. So if they wanted to be a star and they're not, are they working hard? You know, I've got a boy here that's causing me a little bit wrong, and I'll tell you why. He's lazy. He, he is lazy. So I don't focus on that so much. When he, when he, the other day, when he made a sliding tackle, I thought, that's, <laughs> that's terrific, you know, because he, he doesn't work hard off the ball. He likes to yeah. do his thing on the ball, and then when he loses it, you know, he just hangs out and demonstrates here and blames the pass. And oh, I try to do this. I'm just trying to get him to work when we haven't got the ball um, bit by bit. Now, this is going to take time. In fact, I guarantee when he leaves my team next year, he won't be there. But constant reminders with his new coach, with me seeing him play and reminders, we'll get him there. But it's going to take time. Yeah. Because if he wants to fulfill his goals, He's got to be a more a two-way player. He just wants to play when he's got the ball. And that's what he was. He was told, I'm sure, at his club, you're one of the better players. Yeah. You just hang out. We'll get the ball to you. But next level, we're going to play Chicago Fire. We're going to play FC Cincinnati. We're going to play um, the Soccers, <laughs> uh, you know, Sporting Kansas. You play like that, you know, it won't be effective. You will not enjoy it and you will not right. be successful. You've got to add to that to your game. So this is his first year. He's only been here since August. I've seen a little bit of progress, but not enough to say, right, he's where he needs to be. So some of these um, things with players, it, it, it takes more than just the season. And that's the beauty of us, that when they move on to another coach, I'll still see a lot of them, a little yeah. bit in practice, all their games. I'll see them around the buildings. I'll see them at dinner. And I can still give him a message about, you know, are we working hard? Right. Yeah, it's one, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things for me because, I mean, Coach Carter did this with me and our team and said, you know, even when we played well against Vardar or whatever, no disrespect to Vardar, great club, but um, it was a situation where we played well or whatever, we played okay, and he said to us, like, we're not training for Vardar, we're training for the playoffs, we're trying to get to the playoffs. Last year, a lot of you guys got to the playoffs, even the, uh, the under-16s, your team got to the playoffs that, the previous year as well. Right. Both of us lost out before getting to the next the next step. And he said, we already know what it's like to make it to the playoffs. We've already been there. We know how to make it to the playoffs. We're trying to get ready for the playoffs now. And it's that's the exact same thing that I tell my kids now. I'm not I'm not training you for this team. I'm not training mm -hmm. you to be right. good on this team or to tr play against the, the team we're going to play against this weekend. I'm training you for the for next year or the next team. If you if you guys if you guys get pulled up 
this week, great. I want you guys to be ready. And so it's the exact same thing. It's, you know, players think that you're, you're trying to get them ready for Saturday and right. yeah, we're trying to get everyone on the same page and all that stuff. But especially at a younger level, I'm, I'm focused on where you're going to be in 18. I was talking right. to one of my, uh, under nine or Oh uh, nine captains. And he, he was getting frustrated because we had, you know, a ton of chances and he, and we didn't score and he's getting frustrated and he was yelling and shouting and whatever. And I said, Hey, listen, I was 18. I had 18 yellow cards. I was frustrated. I got suspended. It didn't look great. Whatever. It worked out in the end, but it didn't, it didn't look great at the time. I'm trying to protect you right now as an 11 year old from being an 18 year old who can't control his emotions. I've been there. I've seen it. So I'm like, Hey, I'm not worried about this game. You know, he came up and apologized to me. I said, I'm not worried about this game. I don't care about this game. Right. I care about I care about you being ready when you're 18. I care about next year and the year after that. So it's the yeah. exact same thing. It's it's any I mean, there's a lot of kids that listen to this, but it's not about coaches, coaches. And you should be training yourself that you're not thinking about just this weekend. Yes, you should be prepared and you should be playing well and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But it's not just this weekend. It's about where am I going to be in the future? Where am I going to be at the at the next level? Where am I going to be at college? Where am I going to be at the pros? Like, how am I going to, how is this affecting me now? I, what are the things I need to learn now to be better at that, at that age? Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so quick switch college. Okay. So in college right now, in my opinion, there's been too many transfers. There's too many people yeah. going and saying, ah, oh, you know, this isn't what I expected it to be. You know, right. uh, coach, the coach doesn't like me, you know, the, the goalkeeper is a sophomore as if he wasn't a freshman last year. Like you didn't already know. Um, first of all, yeah. what do you, what, first of all, what do you attribute that to? For, well, first of all, do you feel the same way? And to what yeah. do you attribute that to? Yeah. I, I, I'm not a big fan of transfers. In fact, um, way back and that's early eighties when I started, there was a rule that if you transferred, you had to sit out a season. And I yeah. was very much for that rule. And I was disappointed when it, you're allowed a one-time transfer without having to sit out. Now I think it's just same conferences. Sometimes if you leave in the same conference, you might have to sit out. But um, no, I, I put it down to um, the preparation is not done properly. They're not prepared. Uh, you know, even here at Shadow, because I talked to the older boys. Well, I can go there and I can always. Their mindset is if it doesn't work out, I'll transfer. Well, that cannot be a mindset. I mean, you yourself is a terrific example that went through so many coaches. You know, you, you, you're saying that, you know, I'm going for this coach, but you, that coach could be gone in a yeah. year. So there's other things that come into play that are important. And you've got to do your homework. You know, yeah. like you I, say, did, I did. I did. I did think about transferring, though. We, we did talk about it a couple of times yeah, about yeah. Transferring because I felt yeah. like I was being hard done by. And it is. It, and I like I, you know, I talked to a lot of kids about it and I say, you know, I don't believe in transferring. However, I did think about transferring. Right. However, but you stuck it out. You stuck it out. When, when, I first went to SIUE, when I first went to SIUE, you're talking about the mindset. When I first went to SIUE, I said, I want to leave SIUE better than I found it. And right. at the time, I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't really think about it. I didn't really have like goals in my mind. But I said, when I went to Shattuck, you know, we had just gone to the Development Academy, didn't have a great year or whatever. And I was like, you know what? I want to end better than I started. And when I went to college, I had the same mindset. We ended up doing way better than years past. You know, Steph reminded me the other day I made the all decade team. I completely forgot. Okay. And uh, and so that was my mindset. When we were talking about transfers, I thought to myself, well, how can I like what's going to look best for me going pro or what? Like, how am I going to get to the next level if I'm not playing here? Whatever. I know I could play at, the, at a you know better college or whatever, but. I then reverted back to where I, what I started with. And I said, you know what? I came here to improve the program. I knew SIUE wasn't Louisville, you know, Akron at that time, um, Stanford, you know, Wake Forest, all of them. I knew that going there. I felt like I could play at those universities, obviously walk on and, and play at those universities. However, I wanted to go to somewhere and, and improve it because that's leaving a, a, a lasting legacy. And so when I was thinking about transferring, again, you're talking about the mindset. I didn't go in thinking, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll just transfer. Right. I had four coaches. I had four coaches. I could have transferred at any time. Right. You know? Well, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you started 
from the get-go as a freshman and and you knew in that particular program that i think it was eight seniors graduated including yeah. players in your position so you, you know you've done your homework some people don't do their homework they look at it and say ah oh, the coach wants me but does he want yeah. you as his 25th player or does he want you potentially you know the, and the coaches to be honest aren't uh, are fairly guilty of sometimes misleading they're, they're told by admissions departments bring in 25 30 well you're only playing 11 at one time sometimes they have a jv team one or two programs but mostly it's one program with 30 players how are you going to play oh you're playing the spring you, you know so they leave them a little bit up the wrong path sometimes just to get people in in their program because their admissions department said we must have 25 kids yeah. and here's your scholarships to bring 25 in um well 25 you know i mean pro teams on it have about yeah. 25 when they, you know an 18 dress so um but i think it's up to the kids to you know be realistic in their goals and, and where they're going to and uh, and and how they approach you know with their letters and their emails to co to colleges i always talk to them what's their record who's yeah. the coach how many people in your position they have no idea where are they located you know yeah tell me their nickname of their school what was their record three years ago yeah. uh you know it's difficult I mean, it, it was a sort of a bit of a joke at Chaddock in, in your era with the goalkeepers. A lot of them went in and transferred. Yeah. If you look at some of the goalkeepers, quite a few that played with you. And then after that, you know, why? Because, you know, they'd go in, there's senior and junior ahead of them. Well, you're going to play then? Probably not. And then you come in, you're a junior, but he might have brought somebody better in as a sophomore. So you know, they don't get playing time after two or three years. They leave. Now, goalkeeping is a little bit different. As a field player, you can play different positions for the most part. But but I, I don't like the rule necessarily that says you can just go. I was very proud of Flagler. I think I only lost two boys in 15 years at Flagler. And one of those was for academic. We did not have a science. He wanted to be a doctor. I actually called Ray Bunch in North Florida and said, I've got a player for you. You've got his major. Dennis Kelly, I remember it well. He was very happy where he was. He started from the get-go, a very good player, a uh, bit of a temper and yellow cards. You know, in his first year, we were too many, but an excellent player. But he came to me after joining second year coach. I really want to become a, you know, in the science world. We don't really have any biology classes at Flagler, and I helped him move on. I did take a few transfers in, but I was also selective because here's what it tells me: you're leaving a program because perhaps you're not good enough. Now you come to my program. If I don't play you, are you going to moan and whine again and then leave again? Yeah. Or are you going to sit there and work hard? This is what I told Marco Felis yesterday via text. He's not playing much. I said, you know, he's thinking, should he leave now? Should he leave? I said, look, believe in yourself. I believe in you. Work hard, and he's a very hard worker. Work hard at practice. When he puts you on for 10 minutes, Make it the best 10 minutes you can and show him by your efforts of practice and games that you deserve it. Don't just say, oh, well, I'm not playing here. I'm leaving. Again, the next coach will say, well, this guy quits. He doesn't play, so he just moves instead yeah. of like what you did. You got back to it and your senior year was so much better and a credit to you because earlier in your junior year, you weren't playing as much, but you kept going. You still were a leader in the clubhouse, so to speak. And, and you know, if a kid does want to transfer, he shows me that, especially first year, coach, I'm not playing. I, I want to. Well, wait a minute. You've just played 10 games. You're not starting. Kids older than you are starting. What kind of mindset is that? Fight for your place. Now, if you're not happy academically and socially and the whole college is wrong, but if you're happy other things, fight for your place. Yeah. Be determined. Work hard. And, and, and the success that comes from that is so much better than a kid who – clearly has the talent to start and goes through it and maybe doesn't improve as much, but still is a starter where another boy is not quite got that uh, stuff in his locker, but works so hard. Uh, I'll never forget one of the success stories in Mia Flagler was a boy who didn't start till his senior year and then started every game before he was a bit player, freshman, hardly played sophomore, rarely junior, a little bit more time off the bench, but he could only call himself a starter in his senior year. What a tremendous, 
you know, fight for him in terms of what he did. Instead of saying, oh, Coach Moonlin didn't want to play me. And he, he worked hard. He kept going. He liked his teammates. We got on well. I think he, if he was truthful, he would say, you know what? And he was a walk-on. I didn't recruit him. He would have said, you know what? The people that Coach Moonlin is playing ahead of me are better. I, I, I can't disagree with him. They are better. And then he's done well at recruiting and he's brought this freshman in. And I'm a junior and I think this freshman is better than I am. But he was determined. He worked. And he left Flagler with a degree, and uh, he keeps in touch. But he only played one year. He could have left. Yeah. Yeah. And the next coach says, well, you just quit because you didn't play. So every, college coaches, they like to take kids in. It's easy recruiting. But if you look at it, that boy has sort of quit here. And if I don't play that transfer much, is he going to then cause problems? Oh, he's not playing me, and then want to leave again. Yeah. So those are some of the questions you've got to answer. But I'm not a big fan of it. You know, I, I think it's like clubs, Andrew, you know, um, and you remember in Georgia. Uh, We're dealing was, with it here. We're dealing with it here. Yeah. You know, people going to, you know, that was my worst, you know, experience. The club scene in Georgia where they would do a, a tryout at six. Yeah. And then three miles away, a tryout at eight on the same day. Different clubs. They weren't winning. At under 13, I'm leaving. They were on the second team at under 13. I'm going to go to another club and be on the first team, even though that team is not half as good as the team I'm on, but it's their first team. That kind of stuff, um, you know, it, it, it's one of the things I think you wanted to talk a little bit about where are we now and how have we progressed. And then that part is um, going from club to club. Yeah. Of course, you go for the coaching and the kind of stuff, but reasons for leaving and just moving here, moving there. And I, I looked at some of those boys in Georgia that left uh, a team that I was coaching. It was a year older than you, I think, and your team was successful under Coach Dixon. And I looked at where they went to college, and I thought, you've moved four clubs. Was it really worth it to go yeah. to this college? No disrespect to this college, but it wasn't a top-notch college. Yeah. And you've moved, you've left my club, you've left the next club, you've done this, you've moaned at that. And look where you are, 18. You're a bit player at an average college. And I'm thinking all this moving around to show people that I'm playing on a very successful team. Instead of saying, this coach is going to get me there. Okay, we might not win all the game. But who's thinking, like you say, at winning at 13 and under 14 and under 15? All right, when you get to high school, it's a little bit more the winning, and then when you get to college, obviously, the winning becomes much more important. But, you know, and, and again, I'm blaming parents because they're the ones that, instead of saying to their kids, come on, sit it out, what do you do when you get a C in math? Oh, I want to go to another school, different math teacher. Or do you work hard to get your B, you know? Right. So uh, I sometimes blame parents for allowing kids to move here. In fact, sometimes it's the parents' idea. It is the parents, yeah. The yeah. parents say, son, you're not playing much here. But he's happy. He, he likes the coach. He can see that he's getting better. He gets on with his teammates. He likes the next year's club. No, you're not playing much. We're going to move you on to another club further away, whatever. And now all his friends, but it's the parents who sometimes push it too much. And then I want to say to them when they're 18, was it worth all that moving from club to club to get a little bit more success, to play on a worse team and start than try and be on a better team and start, you know, just think, and, and we always say that sports mirrors life. So you got a job and you're not doing so well, you're going to move, a job, you know, you're going to work hard at it to be successful. Um, so, yeah, that kind of transfers and moving from club to club. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan. It, um, I mean, it goes hand in hand. I mean, it's the same thing. And the thing about, the thing for me is when you, you have to, you have to ask yourself because there's, you know, I deal with it all the time is, the parents, you have to realize what is what is your kid what is your kid's challenge right now, right? So what I mean by that is, if your kid's not playing, his challenge right now is to play more, right? right? He needs to play more. So let's work. Let's help him through this challenge. Not just say, oh, let's go over here and see if we can play over here. No, it's let's see if we can play on this team. Let's see if we can work on this team. Opportunities will come. Opportunities will come. If right. the kid in your if, you, if the other kid in your kid's position is that good, he'll get moved up, and now your kid has an opportunity. you got to just stick around for the opportunity. Right. You know, uh, I have kids on my team who have improved incredibly, and now they're starting. And it's one of those things where, I, like you said before, I take more pride in that almost than mm -hmm. the kid who ends up going on and playing, you know, where we thought he was going to play. 
right. but the idea that you know it's not working here so let me go over here right. i tell every parent that there's two sides of it and i can talk to you and i and i tell them i can talk to you about both sides there's the parent who pays a decent amount of money for their kid to play i understand that you're upset about rain delays and all this stuff i get that we'll, we'll talk about that but on the other side from the soccer and the life perspective if you if you come to me and, and talk to me every single Saturday about how your kid's not playing or whatever. It's not helping the kid. And, you know, I'm, I'm having uh, uh, my mom on here um, tomorrow, I believe, mm -hmm. but talking to her about the same thing, but I want to, you know, I've talked to you about this, but I want to get your opinion on this live and direct. But um, the idea that you never talk to my coach, right. the one person who's probably the most qualified sitting in the, sitting in the stands to talk to the coach is not talking to the coach. And I remember Mario at, at college said, give your dad my, my regards because you know the, the one person who could come to me and say, why is Andrew not starting? Why is he not playing? He should be playing in front of this guy. Never did. He never came to me. He never, he never gave me any opinions unless I asked for them. So why, why is the person who 40 odd years in coaching is talking less than the people who have right. six months Six months yeah, in coaching yeah. from the sidelines. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I said, I said to your mother, I said, you know, um, and and when parents talk to me, their their pet uh, phrase is, "And please don't tell my son I spoke to you," uh, you know. But I said, I would say to your mother, I said, Andrew would kill me if he knew that I start going to coaches, even though I I could be qualified. Fair enough, but if I started going to coaches to speak on your behalf, so if a player comes, you know, if you we're not if you were upset about something you go and speak to the coach and as a coach myself i prefer the player to come my door is always open same my door, yeah. in fact i spend more time with kids not playing as much mm -hmm. it's a bit easier now as an assistant but i go to those kids that aren't going to get the playing time that aren't quite as successful in practice that don't get moved up to the next team when, right today we're going to move some of the 15s with the 16s and play a game but a few of them won't I'm going to probably try and be with that group. We might play a bit of futsal because they'll be a bit disappointed. Oh, I'm not going to play up with the with the 16s today, coach. Right. And you're no, not. Quite. But you know, I want to hear from the boy, and that's the beauty of the boarding school. The parents aren't around at practice yeah. and, and games, so uh, you know, I want to hear from the boy. Um, and if you'd if you'd have come to me on occasion, you did, you know, about what what do you think? It would always be go and have a chat with the coach, and I think the coaches would welcome that in fact when parents come and and it's a hard job to do and 40 years later i've just about mastered it but when the parents come you want to make sure that you like the kids all the time but sometimes when there's a parent who's always nagging at you you don't take it out on the kid but you look at the kid and say well, that's my next that? step that's my next step that i need to get I mean, we, we have a player that I, and i joke with him he's a Liverpool fan uh, the dad and he was always really hard on his son and I haven't done this often, but he was a winger. And you know the boy, I think, who just graduated. Um, and in a game about two or three years ago, I put him on the wing by me first half. Yeah. And then I switched Love. wings. So he, because when he went on the other side by the parents, his dad was, you know, was so negative. Even if he played a great ball, scored a goal. Oh, well, yeah, you know, a little clap. But if he did something wrong, I mean, the boy, I felt for him. I, help, I felt for the boy. So it's up to the boy, the player, the girl, whoever, to go to the coach. And don't, and don't worry about what the, the coach will welcome that. And what I always do, actually, when a player comes to me, coach, what do I have to do to, to start? I switch that, and I know I've told you before. What do you think? And you know what? 99.9%, .9 they'll get it right. Well, I, should, could, I could work harder. I could do a little bit more of this, perhaps my finishing here or my defending there, depending on what position. Um, why are you not playing ahead of this guy? Well, he does work a little bit harder. And if you turn it around, he'll answer his own question. Yeah. But certainly the coach will not mind the player coming and parents coming on behalf of the player. They teach him wrong things. Are they going to go to the teacher when you get a C? And hey, that, does it, that, that I see deserved a B. So that's up to the boy or the girl, the student, to go to the teacher. Yeah. Same thing with the with the soccer. Uh, the door's always open for the coach. We want dialogue. We want, you know, and, and, you know, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about where have we come. Well, now we've got video, and I know you're big on the video. 
we can show you on the video now. In the old days, you know, we couldn't do that. But now, let me show you here, 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 and here. Look at that. Are you working hard here? We, we're even doing our own practices now and, and on video and filming them. So we can always go to video, which won't lie. But um, the coaches will always welcome the fact that the, the player comes and will not really. Now, they will have meetings with parents, of course. Yeah, of course. They want to know where they are. But they don't want the parent to come and moan and whine. Uh, I know some clubs have a 24-hour rule. Don't come to me till 24 hours after the game so that we, we get over the, that, you know, your that, feeling. That's what, that's, what some, you that's what someone told me the other day. And I was like, I never heard of that rule. But, okay, well, fair well, enough. Some clubs do it. Some, some don't because they just don't yeah. want people to be right after the right, game. You're the hard because of the result. The parents upset because his kid didn't play and things might be said that if you reflect – You'll, you can still have that same conversation 48 hours later and you'll still right. remember everything, but you might not be so uh, upset at the time. So, um, yeah, you know, parents, um, it, it's tough. You know, for players to make it, they've got to have a good support system around them and parents are a big part of that. Um, and um, just fulfilling their dreams, they should be uh, happy that the, the, their sons or daughters are fulfilling their dream, enjoying their sport, getting better and not fighting all the battles for them, right. um, playing time and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think, so I have two more things. Um, yeah. but one of the things is the idea that in talking to coaches now, the idea, and I don't know where I got this from, but I know is, is partially from you is I've always wanted to keep the, keep the parents in the loop. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with coaches who say, sit down and let me coach. Right. I, I like, this is, I get that this is their child, yeah. right. I get that this is their, They've, they've invested a lot of time, energy, money into this kid. I get that. So yeah. I, I like to, you know, and I do different with different teams because some parents, they don't, they don't necessarily need to know all the things because they'll, they'll, they'll think about it too much and they'll get too in their heads about it. Like, oh, does he not really like my kid or whatever? It's not that big of a deal. But yeah. for me, I like to keep them abreast of what's going on. Like, hey. This is not my starting 11. I'm just seeing what the team is. Let's, let's just see how they play. Yeah. Everyone's going to get equal minutes, stuff, stuff like that. Or if you need to come talk to me, that's perfectly fine. Again, yeah. in a relaxed, reasonable, respectful yeah. manner, we can talk about it. I don't, you know, the 20, 24 hour rule would have helped me a couple of times this season. But, <laughs> well, but, you know, the, yeah. I mean, one reason I like the MLS next is that you, you have to start one in four. You know, I kind of like yeah. that. You can finish with your stronger team instead of just bringing them on at the end, you know, when the result is perhaps over. How are they going to develop if they don't get starting now and again? But, uh, you know, and then Shadok is a bit different because the parents aren't here, but we, we email them every couple of weeks. And we, 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 um, we don't talk about playing time necessarily, but we will tell them. And this week we're working on playing out of the back. So we will tell them, you know, we're playing out of the back. Hopefully you'll see it in the game that that's our theme this week for the next week or two or it's, it's going from the midfield to the attacking or finishing our chance. So we tell them what we're trying to do in practice. Um, because you're right, you can't just ignore the parents. Um, right. You know, I mean, Fergie was big on going to the homes of all these young kids, yeah. these 12 and 13 year olds. He would actually go to their homes and talk to them and keep them in the loop because he realized that these parents are a big, big yeah. uh, factor of how these kids do. I mean, you know, it, they could be negative about the coach and the playing program in the car going home and all. So what they do and say to their kid is that will help or not help you as a coach get the best out of your players. So keeping them in the loop, like you say, you don't have to tell them every single thing, right. but what we're working on this, we've got games coming up, practice today. You can do an extra practice there. Um, take advantage of my video here. You know, just keeping them in the loop, try and watch our under 19s. They're playing at home this week. Um, let the kids go and watch players in their positions. You know, uh, I think it's important to keep them in the loop. Absolutely. You can't just say, Hey, I'm the coach. You just be quiet because right away you get, you won't get them on your side. So I think a meeting at the beginning of the season and then just yeah. continual meetings, a word here, a word there, and an email every two or three weeks just to tell them, Hey, we've got a tournament coming up. Um, what's your philosophy going to be? Are they all going to play equal minutes? Got three games, everyone gets a start. Whatever it is, you know, um, just so that they understand. Because, you know, they're not coaches, you know. And, and, and I always put it, what's your job? You're a doctor. Well, I'll never go and tell you how to do your job or get upset or whatever. So, but it's a sport. And, and you know, I, I was watching games in Orlando and, and 
when you say how far have we come, we've still got parents who abuse sure. referees, sure. abuse the kids. I mean, this father whose son was a goalie and didn't let a goal in. Oh, he was all over him. But he didn't let a goal in at the end of the game, you know. But he made one or two mistakes and his kicking wasn't perfect and he dropped the ball and fell on it. But he was... I, I just felt for that kid. Um, in fact, I had a quiet word. I was close to him and I made sure he heard me you know, without talking to him because it, it was it was brutal. And I think parents, yeah, they get hooked up in everything and, and, and they're excited. and But that's good. But when it yeah. starts having a go at players, having a go at other parents, having a go at players on the other team and having a go, I mean, the, the the referees, I feel for them, you know. Yeah. There's two, the favourite, I must have heard it 10 times this last weekend. There's two teams out there, ref, two teams. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like he's like he's biased. He <laughs> might not be a great referee, but he's not yeah. biased against your team. He's not giving the other team, he might not be good. He might have made mistakes, but he's not biased and saying, I'm yeah. just going to give the other team every call. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Contrary to popular belief, I do have, a code of ethics when it comes to yelling at referees as a, as a coach. I mean, I just, I, I don't like when referees yell at my, yell at my young players. I don't mm -hmm. like when referees try to, you know, strong arm me, but if they make a bad call, I mean, it happens. It happens. Yeah. Um, and, and again, and again, I've told my players as well, your parent, I'm not going to tell your parents necessarily to stop shouting from the side because I know they can't control themselves. So mm -hmm. I, I tell them the, you, you need to develop now. You need to understand that, you're out there by yourself. Yes, your dad might be right across that line, but he's not going to be able to come out and, and kick the ball for you or he's not going to make he's not going to, you know, do that kind of stuff. They're young, they're learning, but at some point, you know, you're going to play high school soccer and your your girlfriend's going to be in the stands. Are you going to let that affect you? Are you going to mm -hmm. let the coach affect you when you go on to a different coach who, you know, might not be as good? But mm -hmm. um the last thing I I'll, I'll say or the last question I have is um we, we've talked about, you know, parents, we've talked about coaches, we've talked about more, more of the negatives. What, what can parents do to be good coaches in terms of, and what I mean by that is not necessarily yelling from the sideline, like, Hey, get wide, get in good positions, all this stuff. But what can they do in the car to, to reinforce, you know, what the coach is saying to help their kid? Because at the end of the day, every parent wants their kid to be a better player, a better human being. I, I truly believe that even if it's not necessarily the right way of doing it, I do believe yeah. that their intentions are good. And mm -hmm. what, um, what can they do to help coach their kid? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, they can offer help to the coach, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, can I help on game day? Can I, you know, that, that kind of stuff and be part of it. Just to get a better understanding. Um, I, I don't think it's terrible that the coach, could talk to parents, not about coaching necessarily, but your goals and what you're trying to achieve and what the players go through. I always sort of joke, all right, we're going to have a players versus kids game yeah. right at the beginning. And they'll see how much, how far behind they are in terms of, oh, I didn't realize how hard it was to do that and this and that, the other. And and, and maybe my son is a good player. Um, they, they just got to be supportive of their, of their son or their daughter. And that means through the highs and the lows there's going to be disappointments and they'll need a hand over their shoulder it's the yeah. same with coaching so they, they've got to, as a parent you know i always felt that the the hardest games that i ever watched was watching you yeah you know i, I could go and watch the team that i supported i could watch teams in my club i could coach myself and i've coached many games but i felt that it was not the strangest, but it was hard for me to watch you because I always wanted you to do well. Yeah, of course. And most of the time you did well. But if, let's say, you missed a penalty, right? You missed a penalty. Oh, you know, I felt for you. I'm not going to yeah. shout and yell, oh, what are you doing? You know, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I just felt for you. So my job then is to help you through if you're not feeling good about yourself after a game, which most of the time you felt good. But, you know, if there was a time – because I want the parents to believe – in their kids yeah and i think if they believe in them they get them over the disappointments the highs the lows you're never as good as you normally are if you win you know and then you're never as bad when you lose and make a mistake and i think the parents have to just be supportive yeah. um 
and 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 not blame coaches and referees and teammates and and that kind of stuff. But just understand they went through something that didn't quite go, or the team didn't do as well, and so they've got to be supportive. They don't have to hide it under the carpet. You know, they they can uh, this thing about not talking in the car about the game going home because you know. But you can always talk about how, how do you think you played it. And the, I, you know what it is? They've got to be good listeners. I think that's another key. Yeah. They've got to be good listeners because you know they've got to hear. That, the boys side of it you know and, and listen to him instead of saying well look at that we lost it's the referee and you didn't play so well did you and remember that time you did they've got to be a listener and, and just see why and what happened and, and just be supportive because you're right the parents love their kids and they yep. want what's best for them sometimes they might go about it the wrong way in sports but they love their kids they want them to do well and they feel for them if things don't go their way sometimes they act out where they probably would regret later. But be supportive of your kids and be supportive of your coach. And that's why if the coach is telling them, hey, look, we're trying to develop them on this this week uh, or we want them to be good at the end of this year, I want him to be a better defender or I want him to, you know, strike a ball 30 yards or with his weak foot, you know, a 20 yard, you know. These are some of the goals that we're trying to accomplish. Whether we win 20, we go 20 and 10 or 10 and 20, irrespective of those scores, I still want him to be able to play when he leaves me and moves on to the next team yeah. as he moves up an age group. His, his, his right foot will be better. His tackling will be better. His heading will be better. You know, a lot of the techniques as a young age will be better. He'll yeah. be better in 2v2s. And, and that's our goal, so that he'll be a better player next year. Yeah. Irrespective if I've gone 10 and 20 or 20 and 10, um, it the results don't matter so much at the young age, like for instance, at the ages that you're coaching. Yeah. So be supportive, be someone that's a good listener, and and because you, I agree, they do want what's best for their kids. Yeah. You'd never say, "Look at you shouting at your kid." You don't love them. Well, that's their form right. of, you know, they want them to do so well. They're so wound up. Uh, yeah. But they love their kids. They do love their kids. Yep. All right. Appreciate it. That's coming up to time. But first and foremost. Appreciate you. Appreciate your Thank your you. mentorship in many many different forms. I mean, we're talking here on a soccer podcast, but we could do a, a you know a mentorship. You, you know, you you and mommy and your, your marriage has helped me a lot. You know, the the way you brought me and Victoria up that could be something as well. So might need to start three more podcasts. Have you on? But um, but yeah, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure we'll have another another discussion. All right, Andrew. Love you, son. All the best. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.